everyone, it's Michelle Caruana from Play Cafe Academy and Profitable Play. And I'm really excited about today's video because not only do I have an amazing guest expert to share with you today, we're gonna be elaborating on how you can execute one of the most important strategies that I've been sharing lately, both on this YouTube channel and on my podcast. And by the way, if you don't subscribe to my podcast yet, it's called the Profitable Play Podcast and it's available wherever you listen to podcasts definitely do so. I'm going to link it in the show notes, at least on iTunes. And that's because I share so many tips and tricks and strategies that I don't share here on YouTube. So the content, while some of it might overlap, very rarely do I just cross post content. 99% of the episodes are completely fresh, new content over on my podcast. So you're missing out if you haven't subscribed. But something that we've been talking about, again, on this channel, but especially on my podcast, is how you can prepare your indoor playground business for two important things. Number one, competition, which if you don't have competition yet, it will inevitably pop up around you if you find success in your town. And then the second thing is a potential recession. So one of the tips that I gave for preparing your business for both competition and a potential recession is to start offering more essential type services, things that parents will value regardless of the economy or their financial situation. And one of those things that we talked about and that my Playmaker Society members are seeing a lot of success with is music classes. And again, even if we do come up to a recession or even if there's other indoor playgrounds that offer similar classes or workshops in your area, I promise you there is room for everyone. So a lot of people say, well, you know, we're coming up on a recession. People aren't going to have the money to spend on music classes for their children. And I promise you that could not be further from the truth. While yes, of course, a recession absolutely impacts more families a little bit harsher than it does others, you don't need to sell your music class to your entire town, to every single person that is on your email list or follows you on social media. Because what I have found that even by enrolling 15 to 20 children, even in the smallest town can be an absolute game changer for a business. And we saw it after the pandemic, and I guarantee you it's going to play out very similarly as we work through a recession. So again, while not everybody is going to be able to afford these more premium type classes, I promise you if you market it correctly and you take advantage of some of the advice that we share in this video, you will be able to establish a real sustainable revenue stream from music classes. So in this interview with Bryson, who not only is a, an elementary music teacher, he also teaches music classes at independent facilities, just like play cafes. So he has a lot of advice about where you can go to find music teachers, how much work you should do as the owner in terms of purchasing equipment and setting it up, how music classes should be organized and executed, what the best environment for a music class is, and how to communicate with parents to make sure that their child has the best possible experience. And so they do too. So they keep on booking those classes. But I absolutely love this conversation. I'm really excited for you to hear it. And if you have any questions whatsoever about executing music programs or anything like that, first of all, this is one of the most common things we talk about in Playmaker Society. So if you're a member there, all you have to do is search music classes. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of posts of current owners sharing exactly what's working and what's not working. So if you're a member, everything you need is there. But if you have any questions or anything else you'd like me to go over, just comment. I'd be happy to take your request and I'll use it for a future YouTube video because I want to create content that matters to you and actually makes an impact on your business. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Bryson, where we talk about crafting the perfect music class experience for your indoor playground business. Thank you so much for joining me today, Bryson. I am so excited for this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And I, I'm really curious and kind of interested to see where we take it. Yeah, I'm excited too. This is a little bit different from the pod or from the interviews that I've usually conducted on this podcast. So I'm excited. So let's get started by introducing yourself a little bit and letting us know who you are and who you serve. 
For sure. So uh, my name is Bryson Tarbett, and I'm actually a, a full-time elementary music teacher um, here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and on top of that, I also run an online business called That Music Teacher, where I help other music teachers um, get the professional development that they need um, so that we can all focus together on making the best musical experiences for our students. Awesome. So I know that you obviously work a lot, like you said, in schools. Have you ever worked with a business in kind of incorporating music into their programs? So I also currently work at a an, an, um, a music studio after school. Um, so I've done piano lessons, uh, voice lessons, just kind of some general music stuff, um, as well as some like toddler classes um, with uh, mixed age groups, a lot of kind of music exploration. Awesome. So do you think that kind of incorporating music into those facilities has benefited both their business and their community? Are they mostly nonprofit? Are they for profit? Can you give a little background there? So the background I work for has been a for-profit institution, okay. but I think that it's just, it's helpful for everyone. You know, not only, obviously I firmly believe in the power of music and, and what it does for brain development. Um, but also if you're thinking about, you know, from a business mindset, which I kind of also understand, you know, if you have this physical space and you're able to bring in, you know, eight people instead of just a few people and, you know, or, you know, using that space that you already have, your bills are staying the same, but you're able to bring in more revenue um, while also having those added benefits of serving those students. Yeah, absolutely. And I love what you said there. And I want to dig into that a little bit because before we hit record, we were kind of chatting a bit and we were talking about, you know, the upcoming looming recession. And while I hate to get into the negative, it's something that we're thinking about. And I was kind of musing before we hit record that a lot of us are thinking about ways to add more essential offerings or offerings that parents deem more essential into our curriculums and into our class and event schedule. So can you give just a very brief background and overview of how music can help brain development? Definitely. So I actually got my background in teaching, um, working with early childhood, you know, three-year-olds, two-year-olds. Um, and, and I've been able to see it firsthand, as well as, you know, through my research and my master's program and things like that. But when it comes down to it, music and the, the exploration and the being able to experience it in a community factor, kind of like these groups classes tend to be, really not only helps with social development, but it helps with language development. It actually helps your brain rewrite neural pathways um, so that you can do things more efficiently and it's creating more, um, more just awareness of what things are and and how to uh, how to use it. I mean, it's really it's literally rewriting your brain in a way that makes your brain um, stronger. So, for instance, we have these two hemispheres in our brain, and then we have in the middle we have the corpus callosum. And doing activities such as music actually functions to to make that thicker, which actually helps the neural pathways go through the different parts. So it's actually changing the physical structure of your brain, um, which is really cool and really has really helpful, especially when we're talking about young students who are so neuroplastic and who are just ready and eager to learn. Yeah, you probably saw my eyes gloss over. I went to school for economics, so I'm trying really hard to understand this stuff, but it's so interesting to me. So when we're talking about these brain developments and especially with early childhood, is there any age that is too young to benefit from music classes? So one of my um, pedagogues that I kind of follow is Zoltan Kodai, and he's a Hungarian composer, ethnomusicologist, and he has he was quoted by saying, um, someone basically asked him the same question, and he said, um, nine months before birth. And if not, not, not even that nine months before the birth of the mother is when you should start music lessons. So the answer is no. I think there is musical, even if you literally are a day old, there is experience to music, being a part of that and understanding that and experience it and using different instruments and things like that, that no matter the age, whether you are, you know, just, just joined us on this planet, or if you're, it's the last day you're here, there is a Nate qualities of music that will make your life so much better um, just by enjoying it. And I always took my children to music classes as well. And I also found it very soothing as a parent. And I felt like it was a great bonding between us as well, not just a benefit for them. Yeah, that's another thing when you're thinking about these these classes that typically are kind of like mommy and me, or you know, you have you know, have a caregiver there as well. It's a great way for them to build that relationship through music and to kind of again that social development, not only this between the students that are in the class, but also 
um, especially for the younger kids that, you know, might not be mobile between the caregiver and the child itself. So just to tell a really quick story, and it's going to lead into a question, I swear, but the first music class that we ever offered in our indoor playground, it was for toddlers. And I thought it would be a great idea to put it like right in the middle of our play area. And it was kind of a nightmare because the kids were running all over the place. They were newly mobile. They you know, we're jumping on the playground and they were going down the slides and stuff like that. And I really felt like it detracted so much from the experience. So kind of thinking of the different environments that you've taught classes in, especially for those younger kids, are there kind of elements that you look for that will set up a successful experience? And are there things that we should avoid? I mean, in an ideal situation, you'd be in an enclosed space um, that has enough room to move, but not enough distractions to distract. You know, I, I think that we need to be okay with, you know, if our students are seeing all these things, they're probably going to want to go over and touch it at some point. So if it's in that room, what can we do to make sure that the things that are in there are what we want them to focus on. So for instance, in my classroom, um, sometimes I will actually cover shelves if I don't want that to be the center of attention. If I want to actually kind of say, all right, we're not, we're not even going to worry about what's in here today. We're just going to focus here. Um, but also just being aware of like, Hey, I'm, you know, it's probably a mixed use space. Um, were, was the rock band in their practice theme before and they have drumsticks everywhere or, you know, are there amps and things that we need to move out of the way to make sure that it's set up not only safely, but also in a way that's set up so that, they can actually engage in music the way they need to be. But a definitely an enclosed space would be nice with enough room. Yeah, and it's so funny because my favorite music classes were in like the oddest rooms, but they were small, they were enclosed and they just had the basics. And that honestly made it a lot better than hosting a space in a really fun area, like an indoor playground. So I typically recommend that people do exactly that, that they have an enclosed classroom. That's one of the things that I teach. It's one of the mistakes that I made. So I'm glad that we're kind of aligned there. Well, and that's the thing is you could have a high quality music education program in an empty room with nothing inside it because we as humans, our voice is an instrument and we use it all, all, all the time, especially kids. They're using their voice constantly trying to understand how it works and, you know, how they can make these different sounds. And I, you know, yes, no, nobody or everybody loves playing an instrument and they love being able to, you know, bang on a drum and play a glockenspiel. But the reality is, is, even if you just have the space, that is enough for a music education program um, that is incredibly impactful as well. So kind of going along with that and setting up the music program, are there specific age ranges that you try to avoid grouping together? Like, for example, would you avoid grouping toddlers with older kids or are you one of um, the more proponents of the mixed ages? I'm just curious. I think there's definitely a, a case for both. I think, um, f first of all, especially when we're thinking of young ch children, safety is is what, something you definitely need to be aware of. You know, you don't want 10-year-olds and newborns to be in the same class. That probably isn't going to be the best thing. Um, typically, I like to kind of think about how they would be grouped at a school. Um, so instance, you know, maybe birth to age four, and then maybe, or even birth to age five, depending on the student. And then, you know, you know, kindergarten, first grade, maybe second grade, and then kind of group them a little bit closer there. Um, not only is that going to help with just keeping the kids engaged because they're, you know, kind of in similar areas, but it's also going to allow you to try different things with those different ages that they might not necessarily have, you know, you wouldn't want to try this something with a third grade class with your three-year-old class, because there's certain things like soft skills, like the, you know, fine motor and gross motor that they don't necessarily have the same level at. So we want to, what you would play in would be different so that you could set the kids up for success. Right. And that's a great point. I love that there is a case for both. It kind of just depends on what you want the goal of your program to be, I suppose. I ask because we get so many questions about bringing siblings and things like that. And I always struggle with answering it in the best way because I want them to have a successful experience. So that's a really good point. So thinking back to, let's say like the babies to toddler preschool age, because they're a little bit young to play like real instruments and things like that. Do you have any go-to equipment pieces or things that you absolutely love to incorporate in your classes? 
Well, first of all, is any instrument is going to be super, the kids are going to love it. And the exploration is the fun part. So sometimes I'll just get like a basket of instruments and be like, all right, let's play along to this song. Um, things like drums are always crowd pleasers. Egg shakers you can use for a bajillion things. Um, but I also love implementing these a little bit slightly more obscure instruments um, that have some sensory input to as well. Like there's a thing called a kibasa, which is essentially like a cylinder with these like metal um, beads around it. And it makes a cool sound sound but you can also use it to like roll up, up and down the arms which is a cool sensory experience um things like a clatter pillar it's like another thing where they, they move it back and forth um can be good for some kind of practicing those fine motor skills and there's just a lot of really good stuff out there i will say there's a lot of really not so good stuff out there um if you like search like preschool music instruments you're probably going to find a big old pack that has like maybe five or ten things that are really nice and then 20 things that are like absolute garbage um so i would um Yes, this is me coming as a music teacher, uh, but I would look more towards the music vendors rather than the early ed vendors. Those tend to be a little bit higher quality. Those things are going to last a little bit longer, um, and they're also going to have a little bit of, of a better sound because I, you know, no one's expecting a, a toddler to have a wonderful drum technique. But the reality is, is when you have ten toddlers on a drum, the, the sound matters so that you don't have um, sensory overload, and also just it sounds a little bit nicer. Yeah, absolutely. And I noticed that when I took my kiddos to music class, they incorporated some other things as well, in addition to interest instruments like scarves and things like that. Do you have any kind of um, other objects that you like to have around or that you would just kind of advise to keep the kids engaged, especially those younger ones? Yeah, I am a firm believer in music and movement being completely intertwined. I use scarves all the time, creative movement, whether it be, let's just move our, you know, move the scarves up and down as we move our voice up and down. Um, let's just play with the scarf because it's fun and we'll, you know, move the scarf fast when the music's fast, move it slow when the music's slow. Um, th those are kind of the main things that I would use when it comes to like what the students are using. One thing that I have found super, super helpful um, in my classes when I w was teaching the the early ed classes um, was a visual schedule, literally saying, all right, we're going to do our, 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 our hello song. And then someone from the group can go up and put a check mark next to it. We're going to do a instrument of the week. And then someone can come up and put a check mark in it. Um, this is really good for um, those older students that are those, those kind of, you know, toddler students that are, they, they want to use the instruments, but no, it's not instrument time. You, you can see we have two things before, you know, first this, then that. I found that can be really helpful, um, but it also kind of keeps the lesson moving um, and it allows everything to, everyone to know what's coming next to kind of remove that anxiety that some students might experience. That's awesome. And not many of us do our own music classes, but just kind of speaking of the schedule, do you have like an optimal go-to schedule? Like for example, is there an activity that you always do first or that you always do last? Or do you have kind of a go-to for that? I think starting with hello song, ending with a goodbye song is a great way to do that. Um, I think that is a great way to build a community of it. It bookends things really nicely. Kids like having that consistency of when we get here, we're going to sing the hello song. And then at the end, we have this goodbye song that signals, hey, it's time to go. Let's not have a meltdown as we leave. Um, and I think that's kind of what I would suggest. Um, you brought up schedules and I, I kind of want to get on, I get, I'll get a little bit on my, my, um, the hill I'm willing to die on is um, the time that you have for the students, make it make sense developmentally. Don't first go what makes sense business-wise. Um, I have taught classes for young kids that were entirely too long because that's how they fit into the way they typically build their teachers and things like that. And it was just way too long. Honestly, for a, a group that small, 30 minutes pro might be even too long, depending on the age. Um, so, you know, going 40, 45 minutes, that can get, that's where we have the meltdowns coming through. That's where we have, you know, parents that might not want to come back because it was just their kid exploded halfway through. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I was just thinking I, back to when I took my kids to um, the music classes I was referring to, and it was an hour and it was entirely too long. Yeah, and it that made is it way too long. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And for us, we always tried to couple the music class. So if it was 20 minutes or 30 minutes, we tried to couple it with either just the option to stay and do open play after or after or something similar, or they could stay and get a snack. They could use the space kind of however they wanted so that they did get a little bit of extra value, but they were obviously, of course, free to leave after. And that kind of, again, helped us 
make what we needed to from the class. They made it feel like it was worth it to, you know, drive there, get their shoes off, get, you know, everyone situated and everything, but I totally agree with you. So, um, kind of bringing it back to what you just mentioned with the tantrums and things like that. When a child is having a difficult time, do you have any kind of go-to strategies to help them re-engage or to redirect them? Or how do you kind of handle that, especially when, you know, one child's tantrum starts turning into a, you know, domino effect? I think a lot of that comes to whoever's teaching the lesson, being aware of the pacing. We talked about, you know, not giving a super long time for the class in general, but also don't spend the, uh, like a crazy amount of time on one activity. Um, if I were to develop my ideal curriculum for, you know, a birth through age four class, I probably wouldn't be spending more than five minutes on, on one song or one activity before we change to something else. Because it's when a lot of times when kids get bored and they're like, all right, I'm ready to move on. That's when those things start happening. And then they, they, or they're like, oh, I saw this. I'm going to go over there. And then, you know, mom says, oh no, you got to stay over here. And that is where the whole thing's going. So a lot of it can come down into the planning aspect of it. Um, but as a teacher, um, you know, if I were in that situation and a student was getting a little frustrated or things like that, and I think you used a really good term, re-engage, you know, how can I get them back in? If I'm singing a song and I notice that he wants to be a dinosaur, all right, what sound, let's, let's, let's do this song. Let's march like a dinosaur instead of marching like, or whatever the song was about, just bringing that in, changing the words to the song to fit the, what the students are wanting and, and what they're kind of looking forward to. Um, that can bring them in. Um, but also you kind of get to understand what are certain triggers for that kid um, and, and figure out, all right, what can I do as the teacher to make that more, uh, more of a cleaner transition. Maybe th some, maybe implementing something like a visual schedule, um, maybe um, asking them for feedback, you know, like, you know, all right, we're, we're doing old McDonald. What should old McDonald have next on the farm? And it gets, it just bringing them back in, re-engage them um, a lot of times can help the situation. Yeah, that's awesome. And that kind of brought me to something else that I wanted to ask about. So I noticed that on your podcast, you speak a little bit about doing like family dance nights and these one-off events and things like that. Can you talk a little bit how you approach those one-off events and classes as opposed to like a series of classes where you might have a lot more time to get to know a student or a child? Can you talk about how you approach those differently? So yeah, um, so you're talking about my podcast, um, That Music Podcast, and in that one of the episodes, I talked about how I did a third grade folk dance night. Um, so this was actually a performance at my school, um, but we brought, invited the family in, which, but I totally think it's something that could happen in, in a one-off situation, um, in a situation like what you're talking about as well. I think bringing in, um, having the, you know, recurring classes is great, but also just having a time for students. Maybe it's just a family music making session. So maybe we ha do have a 10 year old and a, and a toddler in the same class, but at that point it's more of families are making music together because another one of those soapboxes I have is we don't make music together as, as much as we should. Families don't sing together. Families, you know, we, we used to have music that was fully ingrained in our lives, but Think about all the parents that don't sing or, you know, their kids say, oh, I, I, you know, I've never heard my parents sing or things like that. It's, it, it's a shame because music is such an innately human thing. So I think allowing some sort of opportunity for everyone to make music together would be such an incredible experience. Yeah, that's awesome. And for your classes to kind of help incorporate that value into those who attend the class, do you ever give like take home homework or activities or suggestions to do at home to kind of continue that um, music education throughout their daily routines? Yeah, I think that integrating music is a huge thing. Um, so this particular program that I was teaching from did have a curriculum that I was teaching from and it had exactly that. It had like essentially weekly homework that kind of went towards or kind of connected to what we did in class. Um, but regardless of, you know, what you're teaching, you know, having them do something where they're making instruments or, you know, making pots and pans or the beat or um, especially, you know, infants, you know, having them sing the song as you're changing their diaper or something, you know, integrating music in whatever way you can is going to be helpful. Yeah. And I remember when I, again, was um, bringing my kids to music class, I love that they would print out the lyrics so that I could listen to them and so that I could sing them at home because at the class, I just could not memorize anything. I was chasing them around. I was overwhelmed. I was stressed. So it was so nice to just have that visual reminder, again, whether it's printed out or whether it's emailed, having the lyrics to the hello song, the goodbye song so that we can practice them 
it really helped us prepare at home for that next class to keep the kids engaged and to, you know, reduce those tantrums and things like that. So I think it could be kind of a group effort in that regard. For sure. Yeah. I think it is a group. It's everyone is involved. And I like you, you said about printing out the lyrics is I was like, oh my gosh, I would be the worst. Cause I was always making up words to this year lyrics. Um, but what's funny is when the kids know the song, they know the song. So sometimes like I would change the lyrics to try to like engage a kid and bring them in. Like, no, 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 Mr. Bryson, that is not the right word. That's not what he does. So it's definitely, um, it's definitely one of those things where the kids love to be engaged. Yeah. And that's not saying that you have to print out, you know, every single lyrics again for ours, it was just the hello and the goodbye song and kind of those, I guess, anchor songs, I guess I would call them. And then they would have some more songs in the middle that we wouldn't necessarily um, get the lyrics to that they would change every time. But it, my kids love that kind of mix of spontaneity and having those anchor songs every single time. And you, and you bring up a really good point where part of what we are doing when we're having this type of class is figuring out how we can involve the parents so that this continues after the class. Um, we're, for better or for worse, a lot of these parents don't feel comfortable singing or they might not know the songs like you said, or you know, maybe they had a terrible music teacher who said they should mouth the words at the concert or something and they have this you know, fully internalized thing. So what can we do as educators or as people that are creating these classes to make it simpler for our students or parents to engage with their kids, to engage musically with their kids. How can we ease that barrier? How can we give them the tools they need so that they can be musical with their children and, and model musicality for their kids? Yeah, I absolutely love that. And I think that those classes that I brought my kids to really, really helped me with that because I did not have a great music education. I can't sing a single note. So just again, having those resources really, really helped me. Um, so thank you so much for bringing that up. So one other thing that I didn't want to move on this topic from um, before we addressed it, but I saw also on your website and on your podcast, you talk a little bit about inclusivity and accessibility and making sure that you help people adapt any music programs or classes to be more accessible to kids or you know parents with disabilities. So do you have any tips in that regard? Because that's definitely one of the values I talk about most on this podcast. Yeah, I think making going in with the mindset of, of I'm making this place for everyone and mean it. You know, wait, how can we remove barriers to accessing this curriculum? One of the ways that I, I did that is using that visual schedule. That visual schedule is great, um, especially for students that might have um, attention or anxiety or, you know, OCD or things like that. They, they, that they Once they stick on something, they're, they're kind of stuck. That can be really helpful in allowing them to, to be successful. Um, I myself have sensory processing disorder as well. Um, so sometimes music can be very stimulating. So I always make sure that I have over-the-ear headphones for kids that might need them um, because I want them to be a part of the music, even if, you know, we all have drums and it's loud. I don't want that to be the barrier. Um, but just a lot of what we can do comes down to communication, communicating with the parents, the caregivers, um, the students themselves when appropriate. You know, how can we how can we make sure that everyone is accessible here? How can we make sure that everyone knows that they're that they're they're welcome here? Um, you know, how can we make sure that we are truly are leading with our values and not just kind of saying that this is inclusive? but making it a place where truly everyone can be musical. Yeah, absolutely. And my six-year-old son um, is actually non-speaking autistic. And I always wonder, I always wonder if I should be signing him up for the classes that are specifically meant for autistic kids, or if I should be trying my best to integrate him into the general classes. I know there are so many different schools of thought on this, and I don't want this to be like a hot button issue or anything like that. But just from your experience, can we offer the same program to all kids or should we be trying to give parents options or kind of what is your take on that? I think there, like you said, there's so many different things to go into that conversation. Um, so I actually actually started implementing the visual schedule in my class, in my um, early ed class because I had an autistic student who was really struggling. He, you know, part of the, part of the curriculum was animals. There was always a, a beanie baby involved. And he, from the moment he kept walked in, he knew that there were animals and he was stuck there. So implementing something like a visual schedule really helped. It could be completely successful. I am in the boat of 
making a place for everyone whenever possible. Um, I, I think there's, like you said, there's definitely value if you, if you have the the ability and the capability and the resources to create um, maybe a, a specific sensory friendly uh, experience or something like that. That could be also a thing that you could experience or it could offer. But I think that when you go in it with a good mindset in that original class of how can I make this more accessible, you're going to create a lot of opportunities for all types of learners and all types of individuals to be successful, um, regardless of of anything else. Yeah, and I completely agree, um, especially as a parent who struggles with this all the time. I like having the option. I want. I don't want to feel like I'm like my child is being, I guess, pushed to one specific option because he has a disability. I want to be able to feel comfortable bringing him to any class I choose. But there are a couple of things, like for example, I try to bring him with his older brother to music classes and to things that I know he, I can prepare him well for. He's going to be, you know, do just fine with. And again, it all comes down to how much communication I get ahead of time. How can I help him get ready? How can I help the teacher maybe prepare something ahead of time where I know his triggers or something like that? But there are a couple of things like sports, for example. He just can't, he hasn't seemed to adapt to um, certain sport environments that are with his peers. And so I, I need an option for him that's going to be specially trained teachers that can handle, um, you know, non-speaking kids and things like that. So I, I love having options, but I absolutely love what you said about trying your best and going in with that mindset to make every single offering inclusive. And then maybe if there's a demand for a sensory friendly class, or again, having that secondary option, if parents want it, Again, not making them feel like they have to send their kid to one specific option. I think that's a great way to put it. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I, to the core of my being, I believe that music is for everyone. Um, and I think that that doesn't mean everyone in their own silo. We all get to be make music together because that's where the real magic happens. Yeah. So speaking of, you know, helping parents kind of prepare their child in advance, is there anything that we should be doing, I guess, as business owners or, um, instructors or things like that to make sure that we are communicating with parents ahead of time to kind of make them feel included and again maybe help them pre prepare their child to be successful in the class so especially when it's a new student i think any information you can give that that could be shared with the child because the child the kid is probably either really excited because this is something they've wanted to do for a while, or they're really nervous because this really isn't, but this is what their their parents said, all right, this is gonna, you're gonna love it. I know you will, just trust me. So what can we do to ease that anxiety? Could we send them an email that says, or with a picture of us so they know who we are. So when we're coming in, we have a little bit of a, of a they, they know who to expect to see there. Can we see, get, send them a picture of the space so they know what it looks like? Again, all these things that, you know, might be helpful for somebody with a disability, but just is helpful for everyone. Everyone, when one's to know what's expected, you know, what's going to come next and not have to worry about, you know, well, is it a big room or is it a small room? Are there windows? Are there not windows? What can we do to ease any sort of tension? And I think something like an email with like, maybe like a, a little welcome video or something can be a super easy way to not only have the parents understand what's about to happen, but the kids to be involved as well too. I love that you said that. And the class that I actually ended up signing my kids up for, they had like a sample video on YouTube that we were able to watch so that I could see the room they were going to be in. I could see the love format it. of the class. I could see the pacing so that I could decide whether it was going to be a good fit or not. So I think that's everything that you said is awesome. So um, the last thing, well, I guess one, there's two questions that I really want to get to. The first is that I noticed on your website and in some of your um, podcast episodes, you talk about play-based learning curriculum. Can we talk a little bit about what that means and how it might differ from a standard curriculum in a music class or program? So I think that we understand to a certain degree that kids learn by playing, you know, they, they have that imaginative play, they get to make choices and see if they work out. But somehow we shift into when we're learning real things, we shift into, well, we need to have them, it needs to look rigorous. And the reality is, is play-based learning is incredibly rigorous, but we're looking at it through our adult brains instead of the child's brain. Because if we think about, you know, what the, what a, a you know a, a kindergartner is, is looking at when they're playing to learn, 
they're learning so many different things. They're trying things, you know, thinking about uh, an infant trying to figure out how things stack over. They're learning how the world works. They're understanding how things move. And, you know, if I get, if all the blocks fall on me, I don't like that because it hurts. They're literally learning how the world exists all through play. Sometimes we as adults get really stuck on making things look rigorous because of our adult brains. So think about it through your child brain and think about what what are we actually teaching when we're teaching through play? I'm a firm believer in play-based learning. And I think it has so much impact on our students and our kids and our children that we need to look at it and explore it so much more. I love that. And because I went to school with economics, it's or for economics, it's definitely not one of my strong suits. So that kind of brings me to my last question, because, you know, as a business owner, I was very well versed on the business side of things, but I was in no way prepared to run a music class or design a curriculum or set up a space to be successful or anything like that. So for those of us who own, you know, play-based businesses, but who have more of a background like myself, where are some ideas to maybe look for people to lead these programs? So should we be reaching out to schools or colleges or do you have any rec- recommendations about hiring somebody to potentially run these classes? So there are a couple places that I would reach out first. So there are um, definitely college students. This is one great experience for college students that are wanting to go into music ed. Um, I think that's a great way for them to to be able to help build something that that is really important. Um, but on beyond you know reaching out to colleges, um, things like the American Orf Shulwark Association, which is a music education organization, um, the Organization of American Kodai Educators, your state music education association can be a great place. Um, but also just kind of reaching out to um, teachers that in the community. Um, if you have a school a teacher say, hey, do you know anyone that, that is, teaches this type of thing or that might be looking for this type of thing? We the music world is really small. We tend to know everybody, especially in a, a, a given geographic area. And if we don't, we know someone who could find someone who knows someone. So I would definitely kind of reach out to those places. That's awesome. And just a, just a random question, but when you are hired to lead this type of program in an outside environment, do you prefer to do most of the curriculum design yourself or do you like to walk in and just kind of post the class? I know there's all different state laws about how much an independent contractor can legally do and things like that. I'm just curious, how much structure do you personally prefer to have? I think it really depends on the person for sure. Me personally, I really like doing my own thing. Um, I'll be honest, I I taught from a curriculum, but I kind of more used it as a guideline. (laughs) Um, But I I think, again, you know, obviously be legal. Don't, don't do things that are breaking the law, but like reach, if you find a person say, Hey, would you prefer, you know, do I, do you want me to purchase this curriculum for you? Or would you prefer maybe an extra stipend or something to create your curriculum or something? Um, I, for that, 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 uh, studio I was talking about before, um, I actually helped to, um, develop some of that curriculum as well while I was doing it. So it really depends on the person on, you know, the, the situation, but it could definitely go either way. Yeah, and I think having that open line of communication with whoever you're going to have in your space is really important. So For sure. I was just curious and I had to ask. So um, I know I mentioned your podcast and I will link to that in the show notes or in the video description if you're watching this, but where can we go to follow you and learn more about you? The best place to reach out to me is over on Instagram at that music teacher. Um, you can find me pretty much anywhere online with that name, but Instagram is where I hang out the most. All right. Thank you so much. This was amazing. And I can't wait to rewatch this and take some notes. So thank you so much. I really appreciate everything. Thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed this conversation for sure. All right. Well, that wraps it up for today's video. I hope you found this conversation with Bryson just as valuable as I did. And I'm so excited to see how you execute these tips and how you create the perfect music program for your business. So again, if you have any questions or anything like that, please feel free to comment. And if you found this video helpful, Don't forget to follow all of the links in the video description. I share all of the resources that Bryson mentioned, and I also link to his Instagram profile because I highly recommend following him. His content is so thorough and so engaging, and I really enjoyed my time following him. And Instagram, I believe, is exactly how we found each other. So I'm so thankful for that. So again, if you have any questions, leave them below, and I will see you at the next video.